It's gotten chilly in the crypto world. As prices fall, everyone is looking for a better deal. I need a chain that's cheaper, faster, better than Ethereum or other proof of work chains out there. Um, I want to at least mint an NFT with a few cents um, and be able to afford to uh, sell my art online. While China keeps a tight grip on the NFT markets, what will it take to minimize bad actors in this decentralized world? Coming up on Word on the Block, Catherine Ng, Managing Director at Tezos APAC, joins in to dive deep into those topics and a whole lot more. Crypto turbulence has knocked the wind out of NFTs. Monthly sales dropped under a billion US dollars in June, the first time in over a year. Is it time to hunker down and lick one's wounds, or is it time to build something bigger and stronger, and most importantly, safer? How does Tezos, an open source decentralized proof of stake blockchain, which has one of the lowest gas fees around, plan to support the world of NFTs, digital art, and artists. Welcome to Word on the Block, the series that takes a deeper dive into blockchain and all the emerging technologies that shape our world at the intersection of business, politics, and economy. It's what we cover right here on Forecast News. I'm Editor-in-Chief Angie Lau. And today we are in conversation with Catherine Ung, Managing Director of Tezos APAC. Thanks for joining us, Catherine, or shall I say TZ? It's TZ. Catherine, it's TZ. Yes. All right, good. Well, you're the MD of TZ APAC, which is the Asian entity, as we know, supporting the Tezos ecosystem. Uh, In 2021, Bank of America said TZ had the second most developer interest in the blockchain industry. That's, That's pretty good. How are you keeping up with that right now, especially amidst the current market state? Because it's a pretty crowded market. You've got 13,000 cryptocurrency networks. Uh, Those are your competitors. It is crowded space. And it's often hard to distinguish among the most promising ones for those that are unfamiliar. So why do you think there's such engagement for for an audience that is just learning potentially about what Tezos is right now? What is the what is the differential? What is the difference that developers are responding to um, that is so different from other blockchains like Ethereum or Solana or the other 12,998 of them? Yeah, that's a good question, Angie. Thank you. Uh, So you're right. There are many uh, options out there for developers to build on. So why Tezos? Uh, We first and foremost started out as one of the pioneering proof of stake chains. Um, It's really, and it attracted this whole um, global movement of of artists all over the world that decided, hey, you know what? I need a chain that's cheaper, faster, better than Ethereum or other proof of work chains out there. Um, I want to at least mint an NFT with a few cents um, and be able to afford to sell my art online and um, it's it's amazing how these artists also made a conscious choice to uh, mint on a chain that's eco-friendly they wanted to you know, really observe their carbon footprint and uh, make positive climate change impacts so they're like yeah they pioneered the clean nft movement on twitter and somehow it all converged on tezos and it was such an organic, beautiful grassroots movement to see. And now we, Tezos is the de facto art chain in, in Web3. And we've really showcased that amazing growth in the art, digital NFT art space with, um, with exhibitions, uh, large scale exhibitions like, like Art Basel Hong Kong, Art Basel Miami, Art Basel in Basel. So that's like the creme de la creme of um, art fairs globally. And it's also really um, amazing to see how galleries, curators, artists from the traditional art were embracing the NFT movement. So that, I would say, is our core strength, um, in addition to the energy efficiency that proof-of-stake chains like Tesla's allow. It's, it's almost like if, wherever the artists go, this is where the creativity and the innovation also You're like the meatpacking district of blockchain. <laughs> you've got the coolest lofts. You've got, <laughs> you've got the coolest lofts, the warehouses, and um, some incredible artists uh, absolutely housing their work there. 
w- was it always the intent of Tezos to really capture the artist movement? Is that was that the seed of the thinking at the very beginning, or did it evolve into art? Yeah, really good question, Nanji. It actually was something that. Um, the ecosystem did not predict, <laughs> it, neither did the foundation, neither did any of the entities predict that. It was completely organic and viral. Um, before that, we were, very, as an ecosystem, um, very much focused on the core tech development. So we have like 80 PhDs in Paris just focusing on core tech. And the tech is very strong. Um, it's just that it, it's always been, Tesla's has always been quiet under the radar, quietly upgrading every three months with uh, like clockwork without much drama. Um, it didn't, it doesn't get as much mainstream att- att- uh, attraction as Ethereum's the merge, where you're doing like live upgrades on chain, um, merging the current proof of work chain with Beacon Chain, which is proof of stake. Whereas Tezos has already like had that market advantage from day one being proof of stake. And then after that, it's just about being battle tested as a public chain and then upgrading smoothly every quarter. So, you know, if you have a 99.9% uptime and great security and no hacks and no forks, it's it's drama free and there's not much media attention around that. But then if WhatsApp or some other big tech company like goes down and your Facebook goes down, it's like, oh no, my life is stopped for 30 minutes. So so it is it is a thing and um it's it's something that people take for granted in the nine, 99.9% uptime story. So now it's and and when people start to build on chain, it's something that, yeah, okay, the developers don't take for granted. They they do say like, yeah, I appreciate um, this smooth upgrades where I can deploy projects and, um, you know, it doesn't affect my code, my, my development um, for solutions. And artists appreciate that because when they mint on Tezos, um, they, they appreciate the low gas fees. They appreciate that, okay, my NFTs are on chain. And if, say, the platform goes down, which actually one NFT platform on, on Tezos did, the, the the founder of the platform decided to have a, like a hissy fit. And he was like, okay, you know, I'm going to take this platform down because I didn't like something that was be, being discussed in the governance forums. And then after that, like, the community rallied and they actually like managed to retrieve all the NFTs on Tezos. So it's amazing how NFTs in itself enable artists to just not rely on any intermediary, but on a on a very solid layer one that provides that infrastructure for them to have their art like stored safely forever. So help help us understand what is the main mission of Tezos and, and what does it mean for the ethos of Web3? It's really about the inclusivity, democratization of um, all digital assets and financial freedom, really. It's it's enabling people to transact peer-to-peer um, as using smart money. It's enabling people to either launch tokenization projects or explore creative freedoms with NFTs. It's really building that next, um, how do you say this, this next generation of uh either capital markets or the art world or a new metaverse or whatever it is that that does not require the traditional rails of um, financial the financial markets we see today. And it is also creating a different platform uh, for for this art to live both digitally and in the real world. Uh, you mentioned it and uh, we were there. Uh, Tezos was a big part of this year's Art Basel in Hong Kong, bringing generative NFTs into the spotlight uh, as the next evolution in the digital art movement. For those who are unfamiliar with generative NFTs, explain what they are and, and you know why bring that to Art Basel? So generative art is um, a way of an artist to co-create with algorithmic uh, code and they basically enable the participant, the collector, to also participate in this co-creation process. So at Art Basel, we had this live generative gallery where we featured eight uh, generative artists from fxhash.xyz, which is the leading generative art platform, which actually has surpassed art blocks in terms of sales and adoption. Um, it's now it, it basically what happens when you step into the gallery. There'll be this um, 
QR code where you can scan and in three steps you mint a generative NFT that is then displayed on the gallery wall so you can like people get excited about that the art that's displayed on the wall is actually unique only to your wallet address so that's where people get also really really excited because it's like yeah it's like a one of a kind and even though it's from like a, an edition it permutates according to yeah your smart contract wallet address which is very very cool to see and they've been like people like with like hashtag and and like tweet it and it's it causes network fest as well and your friends get excited so they bring back their friends and they're like oh i want to mint this nft yeah it, it was a thing like even our main gallery did not get as much attention everyone just went to beeline for the for the generative gallery instead that's 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 amazing to hear. We did witness that for ourselves. That was really, really very cool to see. Uh, there's a lot of excitement in the NFT space, digital, generative, uh, all of the above. But the excitement has spread absolutely in Asia. When we come back, Catherine, hang on to that thought. When we come back, we're going to dive into what Tezos is doing in China. After the break, China's rocky relationship with crypto and NFTs. The Chinese influence has exerted way beyond its borders, and it's very prevalent in uh, markets overseas, international markets. That, and people do look to China, even though they're governed very differently, for inspiration too. And later, minimizing frauds and exploits in NFTs when word on the block returns. If you don't understand the future, you'll never see your place in it. Introducing Forecast Plus, covering all things blockchain, independent reporting, insights, and access from Asia to the world. We cut through the noise where technology, insights, and access meet, where smart conversations happen. Make friends with disruption. Forecast Plus. We are back talking all things NFTs and wow, talk about excitement about NFTs. You don't have to look further than China. We are back in conversation with TZ APAC MD, Catherine Ung here. And, uh, you know, I, I wanted, we were talking just about Art Basel in Hong Kong. There was just a lot of appetite in Hong Kong, but also, um, what we're seeing really across China, uh, Tezos blockchain was among the first six networks to actually be integrated by the Chinese government backed BSN. That's a blockchain based service network, enabling developers to actually build on the Tezos blockchain through BSN. Being selected uh, was absolutely no small feat. Why do you think they chose Tezos? Um, and what has this integration brought for the Tezos network over the past two years? Yeah, uh, it's, it's amazing to see how China has openly embraced blockchain technology as a form of innovation at, at the government level. Um, when it comes to um, the BSN network, it's a way for us to participate and engage with developers in China in a compliant way. So this is something that we've committed to um, like two years ago when it was announced. And then we're still currently working with their development team to see how can we help scale the BSN network in a compliant way uh, to continue further engaging with the developer community in China in a way that is like compliant with Chinese regulations. That's very important for us. Yeah. Yeah. And I want to pick up on that point because, you know, while there's a lot of NFT activity on Tezos, China's had kind of a rocky relationship with NFTs ever since they became mainstream. Uh, we heard a repeated warnings about the risks of NFTs. Um, investors were forced to resume trading on WeChat groups before the social media giant decided to ban all crypto and NFT related accounts on the platform. What do you think this means for the future of NFTs in China? What, what, are, what are this, some of the evolutions that we're seeing amidst all of this tension? 
Yeah, um, I noticed the the headlines that you mentioned, Angie, are uh, more to do with the secondary uh, sales of these NFT artworks. But I don't think that would uh, actually stop the creativity of Chinese artists. Uh, despite this regulation of NFTs, um, Chinese artists are in our community anyway are still experimenting with with NFTs uh, rather than just buying and selling art. So, for example, uh, Bai Wei, which is a uh, Tesla's advocate uh, and an artist, NFT artist as well. Uh, Uh, we also featured him at Art Basel Hong Kong in our exhibition. Uh, he had his works auction at Senjin Poly Auction House. Um, Song Ting, who is another Tesla's advocate, uh, she is a very, very famous blockchain, uh, Chinese blockchain AI artist in China. She's collected over a thousand Tesla's <laughs> NFT artworks. Uh, she's also the first NFT artist at China's Guardian Auction. They're all still active in the space and uh, actively creating and experimenting. So um, I In terms of that layer, the, in that artistic layer, I don't see anything, any changes. Um, but then, like, yeah, secondary markets is is definitely picking up in mainstream media on 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 the restrictions for sure. Yeah, and a lot of major companies um, actually jumped on jumped on that technology bandwagon very very early. Uh, you got the Chinese tech giants Tencent and uh, Baidu, others really, really wanting to engage in the space. So what we've been actually seeing is this uh, self-discipline initiative trying to kind of navigate and balance. Obviously, there's such huge demand from the artists that you've mentioned. And at the same time, the Chinese government really concerned about a lot of things uh, in the secondary market. How do you see this kind of, or I mean, does it impact um, the, the, the kind of way the NFT market is evolving in China? I would love your insights here. So there's this, this talk about how, okay, how can we see digital collectibles um, Um, but what I mean, like um, Web3, Metaverse, Industry 4.0, the trends that you're mentioning, um, there's always going to be this this market action that we're seeing from millennials and Gen Zs who want to get in on the action or rather they say APEN. And when it comes to the China market, overseas Chinese collectors within this millennial and Gen Z segment, they're going to, they, they would appreciate, technically uh, tend to, sorry, appreciate cultural value in, in Chinese art that, you know, really features these uh, elements of Chinese philosoph philosophical culture, like the bulls of the Yerox, armbits, like these are all on traded on um, external marketplaces outside of China. It's all inspired by Chinese characters. Um, and there's something about this market demand for, for this sort of Chinese um, inspired artworks. And that's, that's a huge draw for Chinese collectors outside of China. So we're seeing that that trend happening. And I think it's it's going to be uh, uh, here to stay. It's here to stay with rules. Uh, so all of the big tech in China are pledging not to uh, establish secondary NFT marketplaces, uh, to avoid the speculative nature of NFTs. It's not necessarily a legally binding agreement, but I think it actually makes the space a little bit more comfortable politically for those projects. Is this something that you have to be thoughtful about, that you have to integrate within the protocol? Are these something that developers, you know, have to be wary of, especially with the integration into BSN? It's amazing to see, despite Uh, China's uh, strict regulations, uh, the Chinese influence has exerted way beyond its borders and it's very prevalent in uh, markets overseas, international markets. That, and people do look to China, even though they're governed very differently, for inspiration too. And and you know, this, this year, um, there's going to be this metaverse industry professional committee founded in by the Chinese government that aims to set this industry standards for um, its metaverse ambition. So they want to talk, they want to integrate and cultivate leading companies and products, strengthen R&D in this area to support the metaverse. And it's it will be very interesting to see how this can be experimented with more open boundaries in an interactive digital reality and explore more concepts of interoperability between public and private chains. Um, right now, uh, there is, I do admit, there is a lack of interoperability <laughs> and, and standardiz standardization um, across blockchains in China and also overseas too, like in international markets, um, because 
private consortium blockchains in China don't really interact with each other, even within China itself. So, um, but I believe like with more aggregated networks like BSN can help actually move this interoperability uh, standard forward, which will help in turn help China's plans for a metaverse more consistent with the idea of like a more intended like interoperable like, um, permeable sort of universe digitally. Mm -hmm. It's a it, look. It's it, we've covered BSN from the very beginning. The interoperability angle is is a super strong um, thesis that everything is now since then being built upon. You know, it is about interoperability. It is about standardization to a degree that allows people to engage. Uh, and I think that you know the third thing: cybersecurity and safety. And we're going to save that for uh, when we come back. We're going to shine a light on the dark underbelly of the NFT world, the difficulties it poses, and what the industry needs to do to secure a bright future when we come back. On the other side, how NFTs are helping ensure transparency and originality in the digital art market. More when we come back. We are in conversation with Catherine Ung. She is Managing Director of Tezos Asia Pacific, TZ APAC, MD for short. Uh, so many acronyms, but <laughs> this is a world full of acronyms. You, we, yeah. We're engaging in NFTs, uh, the, the, the most important acronym for so many people right now. Mm. But you know, increasingly the regulators, uh, this is an, a fairly, you know, an unregulated still market. We're seeing a lot of bad actors. Um, we saw the insider trading from a former OpenSea employee. We've seen rug pulls. We've seen phishing attacks. How do you think a regulatory framework should be developed here? And, and is, you know, I'm curious what the leadership and also the governance and the conversations happening amongst developers um, within the Tezos ecosystem you know, think about this. H how do you stop fraud and exploits in the industry? And, and the NFT industry is starting to be ripe with it. Yeah. Again, um, with this um, issues around, okay, insider trading or um, copy minting, botting behavior, things like that, it's a kind of behavior that has, uh, pre has existed prior and the NFT space or the DeFi space even has brought this up to light even more at, at more velocity and scale and transparency. So it's enabled communities to self-govern or how do you say self-enforce their own rules uh, when it comes to their own NFT marketplaces that they mint on, collect and sell on. An example would be uh, platforms like say um, FX Hash um, having a verified check mark for creators um, who are legitimate um, so you don't in endorse like sales that are fraudulent uh, there's also um, how do you say this uh, Dutch auctions that enable that kind of just prevent botting behavior so people from like just manipulating the prices in the primary and secondary markets of these NFT sales um, it's so the community is actively experimenting with all these different tools around the NFT platforms, which will help make and create a safer space for both artists and collectors to, to transact and buy and sell. Um, it, it's it's a really amazing to see how there's so much grassroots experimentation going on at, at this at this level and at within the community. And then there's the regulators themselves that they are looking into the space actively. So the Chinese government, generally the all regulators, they just want to make sure that, okay, you, we do, you don't destabilize the market uh, when you trade um, if left unchecked. So yes, um, maybe there might be, I, I'm, I'm just, um, I think the Chinese government wanted to introduce new guidelines on secondary NFT trading um, in what is still an evolving landscape. And it, it is still very, very new, um, the NFT space. I think some, some governments are still observing, uh, but ultimately I think that it's actually enabled the art 
space to be a lot more transparent because back then in traditional in traditional art where you don't even know like what's happening in the grey market like it's harder to trace the provenance of the artworks originality it's like That's is true. this real yeah but at least on chain everything's there and then like you can see like okay did you mint this first or did I mint this first like if you claim it to be you to be the original like minter it's like oh let me check the timestamp or when this NFT was minted yeah so it's out there it's more transparent and it's it's at least one step forward towards um, combating these, these um, how do you say this, like bad actor behavior, as you mentioned. Mm. I mean, that open traceability of cryptos and NFTs really, you know, is quite valuable. It's really for a lot of people, you know, that that's actually it's it's almost counterintuitive to, you know, how people consider blockchain, the, the you know, the anonymity of it actually. You, know, you could trace right. it back exactly. I mean, that's the whole point. Yeah. The whole point is that you can trace it back to the origin. Yeah, it's about like It's about security, not so much privacy. Sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's you know these are all very important issues, especially when we think about this as a global conversation, and so many jurisdictions, uh, and governments, and even political philosophies are involved and sometimes they are in conflict. You know, you just take a look at the East and the West, uh, you know, China and the US and that increasing tension between the two and how, you know, how kind of blockchain and, and crypto and NFT development is kind of in the middle. Um, there's just two very different thoughts on how to evolve it, regulate it. Is it a private sector? space? Is it public sector? Is it a combination? Is it a hybrid? Um, you know, being being at the front seat of history, if you will, Catherine, what does the view look like from, from your perspective? Yeah, again, amazing question, Angie. So uh, again, I agree on the different philosophies of East and West and how we're all governing differently. Uh, you know, in Asia, we have a deference to authority. And then in the West, it's it's a little bit more liberal over there. But then ultimately, it comes down to sovereignty. Like, and, and then with the Web3 movement, I see this community movement towards self-sovereignty. But at the same time, it's it's enabling a how do you, self-actualization of goals for the individual and being empowered to do it. But at the same time, they realize like, oh, it's better to do it as a collective. <laughs> so you have DAOs. Um, yeah, all these self-organizing com communities coming together around a social cause. And uh, now Gen Zs are going like, yeah, you know what? My day job is a DAO contributor. So and just <laughs> corporate governance structures are shifting. Not just at, yeah, not just at corporate corporation levels, but like also at, um, yeah, like government levels. Like the way we... Uh, uh, organize ourselves and, and take action together. Even within my team at TZ APAC, we're set up as a corporate, like a company, and within like a local laws and regulations in Singapore. But we very much as a Web3 team are very autonomous and work almost in a holocratic structure. So everyone feels a lot more empowered to drive their own Web3 projects. Okay, if this if my um, guy in community wants to run DeFi, then yeah, he can he can go ahead and explore and experiment, share his research with the team, get a positive feedback loops about it, find a great product market fit for projects building on Tezos, help them incubate the idea, things like that. And if someone uh, is from an art background and she wants to really venture into the NFT space and bridge artist communities with like um, art agencies in Singapore, with art exhibitors, she's very much like uh, welcome to do that and we, we support um, initiatives like that internally yes and within the ecosystem too mm -hmm. look leaders uh, evolving our future in your office right now uh, and really having an impact um, on just how everything is evolving it was great to see a little bit uh, of, you know, what you see. And thanks for sharing all of this with us today. It was great to have you on the show, Catherine. Thank you so much, Angie. Thank you. That was Catherine Ung, Managing Director of TZ APAC. And I want to thank you, everyone, for joining us on this latest episode of Word on the Block. I'm Forecast Editor-in-Chief Angie Lab. Until the next time.